Hello and welcome to our small business stakeholder meeting presented by the City of DeSoto. I'm your moderator, Tenoti Terry, marketing, marketing manager for the City of DeSoto. The purpose of today's meeting is we've all been affected by COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic within the last 14 months negatively affected. And some of the things that we know that small business have definitely gotten their fair share, more than their fair share of these negative effects. But some of the positive things that we've learned as business leaders, community leaders, are that cross-functionality, sharing resources and coming together uh, brings unity and it has all helped us to move forward in life and in business as a whole today's panel. So we're going to jump right in and let's go ahead and introduce our panelists for today. One of the things, if you are watching via Zoom or if you're watching via Facebook, you can, if you have a question or a comment that you'd like to share or to ask one of our panelists, be sure to put that in our notes in the comments. So that's if you're watching via Zoom or Facebook. If you happen to be watching this and it's not live, you're watching the replay, any information that's shared here today, you'll be able to go on any of our websites to find that information and that information will still be useful to you. So I'd like to start with none other than our very own Mayor Rachel L. Proctor. Hello, Mayor Proctor. How I'm well. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Great, great. Now we got some sound. We are all good with the sound over there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're good to go. Okay, we're good to go. All right. So Mayor Proctor was elect elected as the 22nd mayor of the city of DeSoto in February 2021. So she's still honeymooning a little bit in her <laughs> role. <laughs> she's a Texas-bred entrepreneur and has revolutionized the way people lead in business and in public service. She was the first elected to city council in a special election in March 2013 and was re-elected in a general election in May of 2014, winning the election overwhelmingly with 78% of the vote. Rachel has served as the mayor pro tem for the city of DeSoto from May 2016 until May 2019. She is a DeSoto High School graduate. Now one thing about this mayor and my office is not too far from Mayor Proctor's. I believe her office is literally in the streets. She is at every event. If it has DeSoto's name on it, Rachel L. Proctor, Mayor Rachel L. Proctor is there. And so, you know what? She, she has such a, a vast resume, but the welcome, welcoming our first panelist, Mayor Rachel L. Proctor. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. We are excited uh, to have you as well and the information that you'll be sharing. Second, uh, our second panelist for today is none other than Commissioner Julian Alvarez III. <laughs> he is the commissioner representing labor of the Texas Workforce Commission and he was appointed by Governor Greg Abbott in, in um, to the three-member commission on March 7th, 2017. The commission appointment expires in February 1st of 2023. As labor commissioner, Julian Alvarez represents the interest of more than 14 million Texas workers with respect to TWC services and ensures that their concerns are considered in all commission actions. So this is the guy, this is the labor guy. <laughs> Welcome to uh, the panelist, to, as a panelist, uh, Mr. Alvarez, Commissioner Alvarez. Thank you, the mayor and the councilwoman, for allowing us today to participate in today's uh, live event. So we're very grateful that you've extended the invitation to us. We look forward to the conversation with the audience. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that I love Lancaster and I love DeSoto. So I just <laughs> wanted you to know that. So thank you for allowing us to be here. Of course, he would save the best for last when he said DeSoto. Yes. yes. <laughs> Our next panelist joining us today is none other than Councilwoman Candace Quarles. She was elected to the DeSoto City Council in May of 2016. And prior to being elected, she served as a member of the City of DeSoto Zoning Board of Adjustment. One of the guiding reasons that compelled Candace to run for City Council was to ensure that the next generation continued to have a real voice in helping to shape the future of the city. Welcome to the panel, Councilwoman Quarles. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> no problem. And one more other thing. I know you guys are looking and saying, hey, we saw Representative Carl Sherman on the flyer and he's not at the panel. As you know, as public servants, you there are competing priorities and as things happen, you're pulled away. He was pulled away for other business, but he, he uh, Representative Sherman, along with his team, 
they took the time to record a few snippets and a few videos to make sure that his information is shared with constituents and shared with, with all of us today. He did promise that if he saw a slight break, that he would sneak off in a corner, get on his iPhone, and jump in and zoom in. So if he does show up, we'll be able to bring him in. If not, we do have those videos to share that information. All right, so once again, if you have questions or comments, make sure to put those in the comment section and we'll, be, uh, we'll get to those once we get to the question section. Jumping right in, small businesses. So here are, if you're looking at the screen, I think they put a few uh, resource links on there and that's absolutely fine. So uh, just take a screenshot. If you're on Facebook, take a screenshot. That way you'll always have these links and you can refer back to them as you need to. So small businesses and their contributions and or their value that, that's added in stimulating the local economy. Who wants, who wants to take that? When we, when we talk about small businesses, small businesses make up 28 million, um, with 28 million small businesses making up 99.7% of all U.S. firms. Small business is big business, the That's irony right. in that, right? That's right. So who wants to start off with talking about small businesses and their contributions and stimulating the local economy? You want to start, Mayor? You know what? I'll just jump right on you in. Go ahead. Let's jump in. I, um, I love small business. And if you're around me any amount of time, you're going to hear about something about entrepreneurship. I've, I've um, just in the late, most recent years and some, and some things that I do in terms of business things, I, I've started um, entrepreneurial mentorship and things like that. I actually grew up um, in small business. My dad was both a pastor and a businessman. Yeah. So I have literally never worked in corporate America. We've all, my dad always had businesses. We actually have a child care center that's been in existence almost 30 years at this point. And I can remember being very young, 13 years old, in my dad's office learning how to make payroll and managing staff. <laughs> and so just to um, hear those numbers that you shared, um, to Neil, about the number that makes up small business, that's, I mean, that's, that's staggering to think about the impact that small business has. And so um, the contributions are, I mean, I guess we could probably be here all day when we talk about the contributions of small business and the people that are employed uh, via small business and so just to be able to to have this opportunity today um, and talk about resources and how to how we can help to again re-stimulate the economy by helping our small businesses um, is just exciting to think about and I'll, I'll kind of pass it off to you commissioner um, to kind of interject some things there too so thank you and as you know everyone knows around this great state and especially in this area that small businesses are the backbone of what That's makes right. the state so vibrant uh, for those that don't know, Texas has been again awarded the ninth for the ninth time the best place to do business. Ooh, you know, so right, that's Texas. amazing. And as you referenced in my uh, bio, uh, prior to pandemic, I was representing the interests of 14 million working Texans. That's that's pretty good. That's a pretty good amount. That's more than than about 26 states around the country have in population. Yeah. Just what we have as far as our workforce. And we have a very diverse workforce. And I will tell you that as a result of the pandemic, we're now like at 13 shy of 14 million, but that's pretty good. So we still have, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that we still have about a million two that are still unemployed here in Texas. Uh, but the fact that we're experiencing a pandemic and, and, and some of the challenges that we have, we're actually doing really good. Uh, we talked about small businesses. Um, I have laid out to my uh, councilwoman and, of course, to the mayor and to the audience that we do have a website that you see there, and we do have grants available at no expense to the employers, whether they're small or big businesses, free money for upgrading, reskilling, and retooling your current workforce staff. Commissioner, so, repeat that again. He said it's free money, free money. for upgrading, yes. retooling, and, and upgrading. And upgrading. Yeah. So... And it's amazing because a lot of people took advantage of it. So think about it if you're a small business owner, like in child care, like you, Mayor. You know, we are right now providing professional development programs for those child care providers. And the pandemic has allowed us uh, to think outside the box, providing them with free Internet connectivity wow. or resources like that. Or, you know, how a parent can now check in their their child you know now they can't go inside so the technology had to be put in place we did not want anyone anyone to suffer as a result of what was happening during the pandemic now i know i'm going to turn it over to the councilwoman but i also will share with you 
that we had multiple companies around the country and around the world that have found that Texas is the best place and it's no longer a secret. Of course, it's never been a secret to do business <laughs> in Texas like Oracle down the street. Um, Tesla is now in, is now in uh, Austin and a border community in Brownsville, Texas where they're fixing Tesla vehicles, servicing them. And of course, folks like uh, Amazon, you know, we continue to expand with their presence. So I could go on and on, as the mayor said, <laughs> but I do want the audience to know that we do provide services to our small business owners as, as well as we do our large ones. No, thank you for sharing that, Commissioner. And I um, echo the sentiments of Texas is a great place to start a business, be in business. I think particularly during the pandemic, um, we saw a lot of um, our small businesses being affected first. Um, I think a lot of our large corporations felt the, of course, felt the effects of the pandemic, but immediately uh, being a member of the city council, um, you know, we, there was a shutdown mode and um, businesses that did not have things like takeout or online system to do takeout were immediately impacted. Um, what uh, a lot of the programs and the things that um, we as, as residents um, had to offer and come up with is how do we help those businesses to thrive during this time? And there was no end date, right? So there was a shutdown and then was more of a shutdown and then it was even more severe um, at the same time businesses that, you know, just were gathering of people um, couldn't thrive. Um, and how do we teach them some of the, the, the online systems that are here? Uh, I think we all do, you know, the, the DoorDash and things like that. Um, lots of our small businesses here in the community weren't on that platform and never had to use that platform. So um, providing tools in the community, especially with our chamber, of how do we get our businesses to be able to, to thrive, pivot, and then also the employees in those businesses to get, um, to be upskilled, as they said, upskilled to get to a point where they can still um, make a wage and still be able to be, uh, support the business owners and the community. So I think we all had to take a hard pivot um, is how we do business going forward, and small businesses were immediately impacted. And I think those that were the most um, creative or had to use a lot of ingenuity, you know, they really thrive through this. And they, they're, they're reaping the benefits of um, being open to new ways of doing businesses. And the drive-throughs became more important. So I think it's that, um, and that is going to be the future. Like, I don't think we're going back. So those skills and those things will always be into play. And how do we get more on board? And then what else and other resources are out there to make sure our businesses are staying uh, thriving and profitable? Absolutely. I think that once the pandemic hit and probably around week eight of shutdown, we were all looking, I was like, oh my God, I need some hair products. And and I know one of the black owned businesses, it's a small business, and they got creative. They went to the local uh, city government and they were they found out they were able to do curbside. And so that was a service that we weren't used to. And now just about every, everywhere you go, that has been something that Small businesses alike, and especially small businesses, they have been creative in making sure that they're meeting the needs of the customer. In doing that, so let's just jump right in and talk about some of the available resources for small businesses here in, in DeSoto as, a, as well as in Texas. So, uh, Commissioner Alvarez, let's talk about some of the things that the Texas Workforce Commission, some of those resources and programs that are available for the small business owners. And before you start, I just want to make, I forgot to do this bit of housekeeping. I, we, we understand we're still in the pandemic. Everyone has been vaccinated here, so that's why you don't see any masks. But we do have them next to us. We walked in with them, and we will be walking out, when, uh, out of the chambers with them as well. So, Commissioner Alvarez, let's talk about some of the programs and resources that are available to the small business owners. So, you know, I'm so glad that you said that. I could probably just put this as a program in itself, but this, the, um, the Texas Workforce Commission provides an array, a, a, array, a number of programs for small businesses, startup businesses, reskilling, those individuals that make less than $37,000. We talked earlier to one of the uh, young adults that's in here as a student. And uh, we informed her that, you know, depending on how much the household income was, we do provide child care for 130,000 kids every day. Oh, wow. 130,000 kids every day. That's, that's amazing what we do. So the parents can go to work or they can actually go and take classes. So we have a program that will be uh, awarded to a neighboring uh, town like Lancaster 
where we're providing them with what we call the a, a, um, a um, um, the um, not the skills development, but we're providing them with the JET grant jobs education for Texans. And what that does is that is equipment that is actually awarded to folks like uh, Cedar Valley College received one. And that's for equipment that these individuals early on can use to train. That's at no expense to both the students or to the community or to the school itself. So this money is appropriated, and I think this would be a, a, a good time for me to share with the audience that uh, Representative Carl Sherman has been very dedicated to making sure that money is actually driven to this area. So not only does he do a really good job of representing this great area and this state of ours, but representing his district. I am amazed by the great work he does, but thank him for that because that money is actually appropriated by him. And then we have the Skills for Small Business uh, grants that are available. And some of these grants will pay up to $1,800 for new hires. And then, of course, it has $900 per incumbent workers. It's a 12-month period. It's, uh, these are, this is another grant that's available. And then we have, um, we have uh, skills for, to recruit Texas. So Recruit Texas is if you have a company that's looking at coming into your neighborhood, we want you to use it as an enticing mechanism or a tool to bring somebody in and say, hey, look, we can assure you, working with our chamber, working with our EDC, and of course the city management, that we want you to come in and hear some of the training dollars that we can provide to you as a result of you coming into my town. And so those things are important. Sure. And then, of course, we have loans or we have um, services for people with a disability. We just rolled out an initiative that we rolled out from my office, and that was any employer who hired individuals, at least 10% of their workforce would be recognized. Now, that's admirable for small companies or large companies. Think about it. We're, we're now looking at that population because, remember, we were talking about the 14 million working Texans. Prior to the pandemic, the state of Texas was at a 3.4 unemployment rate. Wow. So that's amazing. So where are we getting these people? We've been working with Carl Sherman and some other great legislators about these individuals that have been incarcerated. In this community, the Dallas area, South Texas, we are providing them with an opportunity to train while behind bars so that when they get released, we now have a credential for them. So we're excited about that. Again, I could go on and on about some of these great programs, but we also have programs for those individuals that are deficient in math or English skills or can't read, and that's through our Adult Education and Literacy Grant. What that does is if somebody's having trouble with their math skills, let's say we're trying to get them into college and they can't read a tape measure, we're helping them with that. So it's or not some, too late to learn. So it's really good. And so, and, and again, I want the audience to know, as you know, and again, I want to thank the councilwoman for allowing me to be here because, you know, she was under the impression that, you know, we were going to be focusing in. I'm sure some of your, re, your listeners will be talking to us about unemployment insurance benefits. But there are so many great things that are happening in your community. And I can tell you that this area has been very proactive in their approach in training individuals. And that says a lot about DeSoto, Texas. Absolutely. So a lot of those different programs, you, a $1,200 uh, for Recruit Texas, you have all these different pro uh, programs available, educational programs, even uh, disability, disabled uh, pro programs for disabled uh, citizens as well. So wherever, whatever your lane is or wherever you fall, or even if you don't um, fall in any of those lanes, but you know someone, share the information. These resources are available to you as a citizen. So please, please, please utilize these resources. They're, they're for you. So utilize them. You know, we want to be able at the end of our fiscal years to say we use every single last cent of all of these, of all the dollars or all the money that we were awarded. And that's how we're able to do more the next year and the following year. So definitely take advantage. And as you see on the screen, um, the, the website links to be able, you know, take a look at these different websites and some of the programs that Commissioner Alvarez has talked about and, and just find a little more information. If it doesn't fit you, then please be a friend and share the information. Let's go ahead and talk about our very own city of DeSoto, some of the programs and resources that are available here in DeSoto for small business owners. Wow. So one of the first things that I want to talk about that I'm extremely excited to share with you all, and many of you, of course, if you're a DeSoto resident, more than likely you know about this one, but it is our Grow DeSoto Marketplace. It is our small business incubator. And that was actually one uh, project that we did. It's a public-private partnership. But actually, the space that it's in, um, we came up with the concept because that particular space was actually going to become a dollar store. 
Oh, wow. And our mayor at the time, uh, the late Curtis D. McCowan, she brought us all together and we began to brainstorm about how could we actually better utilize that space and make it a space that we're able to actually provide some different um, things for our residents. And DeSoto is a very small business friendly city. We love our small business owners. We love our entrepreneurs. And so we came up with the idea to create a space that lowered the barrier to entry for small business owners. A lot of things we see, and you all know this, a, a lot of what stops entrepreneurs from really getting in the game and really being successful is the barriers that are presented as it pertains to capital and just getting started. And so some of the um, the benefits of being in that particular space is a low entry to market as well as like reduced rates and all utilities are included in those particular things. And so some of the goals that we have for the entrepreneurs there is also to get that small business mentorship that is available there. And what's so great about it, Commissioner, is that the resources that are available to the entrepreneurs that are tenants within the incubator is actually made available to the community as a whole and so the community anyone in the in the uh, the city of DeSoto can go to the small business incubator and receive information on how to get their financials done how to create a business plan all of these things get their licenses right get all of these certifications that they need to be successful in business and so we're super excited about that and so we're actually going on four years for that particular project Wow and we're happy to say that it actually is almost full. So mm -hmm. we, you know, and if we were, you know, in the beginning, you know, things when you're trying something new and a new concept, um, you, you kind of, some of those things have, have to uh, get themselves worked out. But we were able to especially provide assistance, as we talked about during the pandemic, um, to be able to help those entrepreneurs ride that wave. And so we were happy to be able to do that. And so you can visit growdesoto.org to learn more about this concept and to determine if the Grow DeSoto Marketplace is actually right for you and your business, as well as apply for that if you see that it is a space that could possibly be helpful to grow your business. And just one other thing, even if you're not in the, the, the market of being a business owner, just go support. Go, right. go support your, lo your local uh, citizens, and they have some amazing things in there. Uh, Kathy and I were just saying we, we have to go over there for lunch uh, one of these days. Absolutely. We're going to sneak off and go over there for lunch one of these days. But just going to support as well. So you'll find some great things in there and we're cranking out some amazing entrepreneurs out of there um, I go over there because I'm, I'm a vegetarian so I go over there and get we actually had one of our business owners uh, she does Nashville hot chicken and she actually opened up another restaurant wow. next to hers within the incubator for vegan uh, vegan food she does vegan burgers and vegan milkshakes so if you're in the market for that uh, head on over there and see her <laughs> so DeSoto but, does have vegan yes we do have some <laughs> vegan and healthy <laughs> option yes and so and I never heard of vegan milkshakes That's until awesome. I went over there that's awesome. So if I can find a vegan rib spot, I'm going to be doing good. But she deserves I haven't found grant, one just Mary. yet. She deserves a grant. <laughs> she deserves a grant. I'll let her know that. But um, we're just excited. If you can't tell, I get excited when I talk about things, especially as it pertains to the success of entrepreneurs. And so that's what that's really special. And I can go on to the next one. If, if Absolutely. I, all right. And we also have the ICSI Customer Service Excellence. These are actual virtual workshops. They're 90-minute sessions that actually focus on customer service and social media integration. And so Councilmember Quarles kind of touched on some of the things that, of course, that were kind of exacerbated and amplified during the pandemic in terms of the digital divide and just really the lack of information or the lack of skills that our entrepreneurs had around social media and things like that because people just couldn't get out. And so people People were on social media more and people were getting uh, online to do more things and so this program actually assists business owners and their employees in customer relations, branding, engagement, and successfully navigating social media platforms as a result, again, of COVID-19. And so these free workshops, and I'm going to say that again for those in the back. Free 99. <laughs> these free <laughs> workshops are courtesy of the City of DeSoto, the DeSoto Economic Development Corporation. Um, and although they're free, you do want to register. And so for more information, you can actually go to DeSoto, Texas, and Texas is spelled out, DeSotoTexas.gov or D-E-D-C dot org to get more information on those. So training, so training is available. All of these, not only financial, education, 
child care, all types of training, all types of resources. They are here. Please visit these websites. They are here. Before you go to the next program, I, I want to talk about something that if you have, if you follow the City of DeSoto's Facebook page or any of our social media pages, or if you follow Mayor Rachel's page, she has all the information. I don't even, I think she should be like a mini channel six or two or something. <laughs> She, every before the communications and marketing teams can get it posted on the city of DeSoto's page, page, she's already shared it. It's like oh, three hours ago. Like we just got out of the meeting. Wait, what? <laughs> so she her her Facebook page, social media, um, as well as Councilwoman Quarles, their face social media know, platforms are. Uh, if you want the up to date information, you can follow theirs and, and go to theirs as well. But something that you've probably been seeing um, that's circulating on our page, something called Ban the Box or Fair Chance Hiring. And one of the uh, advocates for this is actually Councilwoman Candace Quarles. So if you just talk a little bit about Ban the Box and the Fair Chance Hiring Force. Yeah, so um, basically what this is is in um, early this month. Uh, it, it seems like it was five months ago, but um, early this month the, the council, DeSoto City Council, um, passed an ordinance citywide that um, we would not ask criminal history questions before an applicant has an opportunity to interview. So that uh, initiative is called Fair Chance Hiring, also known as Ban the Box. So what that is is it is banning the box on the application to ask about criminal history, have you been arrested, have you had a misdemeanor, have you had a felony, these type of questions, what we found is that there are barriers um, when it comes to employment. So people have, um, as Commissioner just said, we have an incarcerated population here in Texas. They serve their time, uh, they're coming out looking for re-entry. Uh, one of those ways to be successful about re-entry into uh, to being a contributing member of society is to having access to a good job. Absolutely. What we found is that question that people are being judged, prejudged, before they even have an opportunity to even explain their story. Um, so the question is just being pushed back into the, later into the process, but it allows them to be, um, to judge on their qualifications and skills for the actual position instead of just kind of leading with their worst mistake. People deserve second chances, things happen. So after they've done what they should have done, they serve their time, they're coming back into community. How can we make sure that they have access to being a member of society, taking care of their families? Because if you don't have access to those things, um, what happens is recidivism. They go right back. That's right. So that's why it was important that um, we put that um, policy in place. It's effective January 1st of 2022. It sounds like that was, you know, 20 years ago because I graduated in 2000. I'm like, wow, we're in 2022 already. But um, so that policy being in effect uh, January 1st. And then um, small businesses are excluded from that policy. So if you have less than 15 uh, employees, um, you will not um, have to adhere to that policy. What we found is small businesses are actually the most flexible when it comes to backgrounds and also nonprofits um, here in the city. But uh, we're the second city in the state to, to, to have that policy in place uh, for the, of course, the city of DeSoto is going to lead that effort, and we'll have ours up and running, um, probably already going, where we're not asking that criminal history question. But as uh, far as private employers citywide, that will be in effect January 1st. But it's just setting a, it's setting a tone that we want everyone to have access. We want everyone to be a part of the community. We want everyone to be able to take care of their family, um, to take care of themselves. So this is, it makes our community safer um, when we have individuals coming back from serving their time or if, if they didn't serve time probation, that they're not being asked that question first. So um, it has been proven to be effective. The ACLU of Texas is where it's really been pushing this uh, kind of across the country. Um, it's about 36 states that already have it statewide <laughs> and then another 150 cities that are already offer it um, or has this in place. And then uh, corporations like Starbucks, Target, um, Walmart, they already don't ask this question because what we find is people make mistakes and um, they deserve, you know, to have a second chance. And that's, that's what Fair Chance Hiring is. It, it literally just gives people an opportunity to share their story. And sometimes in your 20s you do things and they're still there, and if I had an, an opportunity to tell you what happened or share that with you, and then also how I've overcome it. Um, and now I'm, you know, I'm a contributor of society. I went to college, these things happen. So now here I am, and I just want to work for you. So um, the council um, was supportive of that initiative, and uh, I spent 12 years in human resources before 
being in politics, and I know firsthand how intimidating that question can be. I know people who don't apply for the job at all because that question is on there. So it's just a small thing, but it, it, it sets the tone and the stage for who we want to be and um, to be working to be work in our community, who we welcome here, and then particularly for communities like DeSoto, where we're a majority minority, this question is important. Is important. So I'm thankful for um, the entire council and the mayor for supporting that initiative. Can I add to that? Absolutely. So um, when we first met, mm -hmm. that's what it was. That was the discussion that she had uh, mentioned to me, her passion for those individuals that had been incarcerated. And um, I did inform her, uh, the councilwoman at the time, Quarles, and of course now I'm going to inform the audience, that for those that do disclose that they've had a criminal history, Mayor, just so that you know, we do provide employers who hire these individuals with a tax credit. So they receive a tax credit as an incentive. The other would be fidelity bonding. So that would mean, you know, we, we, we're bonding these individuals. We're reassuring you that they're not going to steal or they're not going to do anything. And if they do, they're being bonded. And so we're so committed to making sure that this population is addressed that that's what we've done to uh, reassure folks like you, uh, Councilwoman Corrales and Mayor, that uh, our commitment to making sure that these individuals have a second chance. And again, as I mentioned earlier, even Governor Abbott has referenced that everyone deserves a second chance. That's right. Absolutely. Everyone does des deserve a second chance. And, and even in DeSoto, we have already started. I've been in meetings. I've already been planning on identifiers for businesses. So businesses be on the lookout. We'll be getting that information out to you so that we can, you could have an identifier to say we are a business that supports Ban the Box and Fair Chance Hiring. So that marketing information will be coming out very, very soon. All right, Mayor, Mayor Proctor, let's talk about a few more of the pro programs or resources that are available at the City of DeSoto. Sure. So I want to share two more, if that's okay. Uh, one is our Economic Development Corporation, or uh, now it's known as our DeSoto Development Board. And so, of course, again, we here in DeSoto, we champion our entrepreneurs, and so this particular corporation, it works to provide resources, and so some of the, some, and one example of that that I can think of off the top of my head is our facade grant. So it's a 50-50 matching grant uh, for businesses here in DeSoto, and they can take those, uh, take opportunity with that. Also with training and guidance, um, just to help those that are trying to make the leap into successful business ownership. And so our DeSoto Development Board is actually one of the uh, partners that are within our Grow DeSoto Marketplace. So, again, if you want to get more information on any of the programs that they specifically provide, you can go to DEDC.org or, again, DeSotoTexas.gov. Now, another one that I wanted to highlight, and uh, that's actually happening tonight. So this is, again, very exciting. So um, if you're available, I believe it starts at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, if you're watching in another time zone. So that's Central Standard <laughs> Time. Uh, it is going to be uh, through the Minority Women in Business Enterprise, or MWBE, and local businesses. It's going to be diversity vendors and historically underutilized businesses and other also known as hub. There's going to be a virtual workshop tonight from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. and you're going to be able to learn how to do business with the cities and get information about upcoming procurement opportunities. I think if there is a, a question that I get a lot from individuals is how do I do business with the city of DeSoto? And so the, the great thing about the event tonight is that it's going to be showing you how to actually do business with several different cities. So there are several partners in this, the city of Lancaster, the city of Cedar Hill, of course, DeSoto, as well as the city of Duncanville. And they will be hosting this tonight. And so you can actually visit our homepage at DeSotoTexas.gov to actually get more information. And I believe they have the flyer for that up now um, on how you can actually register for that. So that's going to be very exciting as well and some very valuable information shared. And that is, like again she said, that is tonight at 6 p.m. Now, if I could interject on this particular item, um, uh, particularly with the city of DeSoto, we implemented um, having uh, minority women-owned businesses get um, at least a minimum of 20% of all the city contracts. I think that's important when we're talking about communities like our neighbors in Lancaster and Duncanville and DeSoto. Um, what's the makeup of the demographic? Are they getting contracts with the city? So when we put this in place, um, it was definitely to highlight and target who's in our backyard 
uh, we're, we have all these companies and all these small businesses that can do roads and streets and grass and, and, and do all these things, but are they actually getting, you know, some of these big, larger contracts here with the city? So, again, this council, um, as you said, Commissioner, is something happening down here in the Best Southwest? It is. It's things like that. Like, we're trying to do all of it. We're trying to make sure that people are gainfully employed and they're getting contracts in the customer service program and Councilwoman Marks. And we're, it is intentional on purpose, and we have leadership like um, the mayor to make sure that um, we're, we're, we're making sure we're taking care of our own. We're taking care of our, our residents, our backyard, and making sure that they have a piece of the pie. They're in front of the line. They're getting the information. They have access to us, to you. It was is not by happen chance that you come here. We will be leaning on you, Commissioner. <laughs> well, let me tell you. <laughs> I have a direct line to DeSoto. Uh, Expect I, our man. call. I, I, it doesn't surprise me the energy for those that are not able to attend in person. There is so much energy here in DeSoto. I mean, it was obvious when I first walked in. And, and the folks that we have today on the panel are doers and shakers. And I can assure you, I, I know what I'm talking about. And the other thing is DeSoto has always been proactive in the approach that they've taken, making sure that everyone has the right tools to be successful. Mayor, you mentioned something about the um, DeSoto development uh, board that you have. Um, and so for this incubator or this facility that you have for small business owners, Keep in mind that we have the high demand grant, which I referenced earlier. This grant allows us to partner up with a 4A, 4B, which you all are. Mm -hmm. And this allows us to leverage money up to $150,000. That's assuming that our local workforce board, which is Lori Larea that runs it, she has the money available and committed, not committed to anyone else. But what that does is it leverages the funding. And one of the things that we're really good at is blended services. So I've talked a little bit about the various grants that we have. So if you're a high demand, I'll give you an example of a community very similar to DeSoto. They opened up two cohorts of, of two classes, uh, cohorts of 20 people, individuals, uh, folks uh, that were interested in cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And so what we did was through a high demand grant, we provided them 50,000. Uh, the EDC paid 50,000 and it was an eight week course and we paid for the credentialing, the certifications, the training, um, all of the stuff needed. At the end of the eight weeks, every individual in there received four CompTIA uh, 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 cybersecurity credential, A+, plus, Security+, plus, Network+, plus. and so this was done at no expense to them. Uh, following graduation, the local workforce board had a job fair, like you have here, the virtual one, and every one of those people or those participants were hired. Some went to go work for Boone's Allen Hamilton in San Diego. As we know, that's a civil defense, very, very reputable company um, that's global. And the, one of the young adults that went in there never went to college, uh, graduated after eight weeks, earning $108,000 because of the cyber. Another wow. one went to go work for the city of Laredo. Another one went wow. to go work for another company. So uh, banks were in demand of the cybersecurity specialist. Yeah. And so these individuals did really good. And so the match that the city gave us was allowing them to pay the participants, because some of them were educators. They were professional folks. Some of them were, and some were right out of high school, but it was a, a, an ability for the city to pay a stipend while they were in the course. And so, again, the professional development courses that you're offering for these women and these programs uh, is available to you. Uh, I know you all have a good relationship with our local workforce board. I would encourage you to continue having that dialogue with them. But many of the programs that I'm sharing with you all, again, as I reference, is free. Sometimes people think there's a catch to it, but I can assure you there's no catch to it. We just want everyone to be successful. That's awesome. I can't, I can't stress this enough. I'll be saying this throughout the entire panel. Please, please, please go to these websites. Check out the information. If it does not apply to you, forward it to a friend. We want to make sure that everyone wins, and especially these small, the small business owners. We, uh, just moving right along, we want to look at and talk about the importance as an elected official to um, advocate and lobby for these types of resources for small businesses. And so if you take a look at your screen now, we have Representative Sherman with a pre-recorded video um, to talk about that. I'm Carl Sherman, Texas House of Representatives, District 109, and I can't tell you how excited I am about being a part of this DeSoto Presents uh, Small Business Stakeholders Summit. And as I've joined or are joining uh, your great mayor, 
Rachel Proctor, as well as Representative Candace Quarles, who's been a champion for small businesses since she's been on the council, and my good friend, Commissioner Alvarez. It's so good to be a part of this. When we look at the resources and the network or advocacy for small businesses, those are two very critical things to ensure and increase the probability of success in participating in bidding, in the bidding process for the state of Texas. You don't want to miss out on the opportunity to bid for contracts with the state of Texas. As a member of Appropriations, I'm one of 27 representatives in the House of Representatives of 150 that serve as an appropriator to create a budget for the state of Texas and for our House to ratify. That budget surpasses $250 billion. There are many agencies that that budget represents, and as a small business owner, it is important that you buy for the contracts that are there. Now, I would also encourage you to ask your local elected officials for letters of recommendation that they can help to ensure that they're advocating for small businesses. After all, small business hires more people than our Fortune 500 companies combined. And so it's critically important that you participate in the process and ensure that you get a portion of what you are already paying in taxes to this great state. All right, there you have it from Representative Sherman. I'm Carl Sherman, Texas House. Even virtually, he'll take over the room. All right, well, let's just go ahead and jump right back into the impact and the role of government statewide and citywide. Uh, we will, uh, let's just go ahead and hear what Representative Sherman says on this, and then we'll bring it back to the panel. House of Representatives, District 109, and I can't tell you how excited I am about being a part of this DeSoto Presents. That, that's a good question. When you look at the impact role of state local, and I would add the federal government as well. Uh, many people, both federal officials, state officials, and sometimes local officials, along with the public in general, don't seem to realize how crucial state and local government and the federal government is to our overall economy. The state and local governments and the federal government taken together comprise one of the nation's largest industries, so they have a much greater economic impact than many understood. Take, for instance, uh, the depression or recession uh, that we had uh, back in 2018. Uh, there was a stimulus package that was offered. Uh, the stimulus package passed, but they negated to put in funds to bail out state and local government. And so that prolonged the recession because many of those state agencies and local governments had to lay off people. The recession has a lagging impact on state and local government because the way proceeds are paid into those budgets is your taxes. And so those taxes often are, uh, you know, for the local governments, it's going to be a property tax paid once a year. The sales tax, primarily, 65% of our overall budget at the state of Texas, uh, the $250 billion plus uh, budget that we have in receivable, depends on uh, sales tax. So those are often felt sooner than the local government and state begins to lay off. So it's very important to understand that. Because in addition to paying employees and providing public services, it's sometimes forgotten that state and local governments are substantial buyers of goods and services from private business. Now, by one estimate, local and state governments spend as much as $2 trillion a year, $2 trillion a year, 
purchasing goods and services from private businesses. And when a state or county repairs a road or a bridge, they're using private companies to do that. So that's why it's important that you as local small businesses make sure that you're at the table to negotiate and bid for those contracts. Because the state and the local government buy furniture, we buy paper, we buy office supplies, we buy equipment, we buy vehicles, and all sorts of products that your company may be offering. So it's important that you see the government as a part of the potential client base that you can serve. After all, it's your tax dollars. And when you work for those tax dollars, I would say it's your tax dollars at work. Your tax dollars at work, absolutely. So just a reminder again, that meeting on how to become a vendor for state services, local government services, that meeting is at 6 p.m. And you can visit our website, and that's desototexas.gov. All of the information is on there. The registration link is on there as well. So the impact and role of government statewide, citywide. So let's talk about that a little bit as the mayor of the city of DeSoto. Local-wide, the impact of having small businesses. I mean, really, I think we've said it before here. I think we kind of started with that, that small business makes up a large part of what drives our economy here locally, um, as well as just, you know, um, just all throughout the nation. And so to be able to, we have to, as local um, local elected officials, have that, um, that, that, um, that, that policy and just that, that um, intentionality around things like this and forms like this and making sure that we're getting resources. And I think, Councilwoman Cors, you mentioned this, making sure we're getting our piece of the pie as it pertains to the resources that are available for our communities. And so, um, you know, that's just, that's always been just very important and it needs to be something that's always at the forefront because when we talk about economic development, I'll just be honest and be transparent here. That's an area that the city of DeSoto has has struggled in a lot and has a lot of challenges. And I think it's not just the city of DeSoto, but just the southern sector of Dallas County as well. Um, there, there's a lot that I could probably go into and say, and I'll, for the sake of time, I won't. But just as local elected officials, we've got to make sure that we are the first champions to make sure that we are advocating for our small businesses, advocating for the resources to get to our area. And so I'll stop there um, and see if anybody else has anything they want to add to that. Yeah, I would, uh, I would also add um, it's important as local elected officials from our purview, from, from our perspective, where we see we're closest to the people. Yeah. We, we, we feel it when businesses in our community shut down. Uh, we feel it when they move just across the street to Cedar Hill or to another city. Um, so it's, it's incumbent upon us to take that and say, what can we do specifically um, in, our, in our responsibility as local elected officials? And uh, we, we talk about this on the council that the, the budget that we have as council members, it's a moral document. It says what we think is important. Where in our uh, budget are we putting energy towards the business incubator? How much of a percentage is towards that? Where are we putting money towards the job fairs? Where are we putting money towards developing some of these things our small businesses need? During the time of COVID, when there are lots of funds being dispensed, we made sure that our small businesses had access to some of those grants. Um, but we as council people can't say that it's somebody else's job to make sure that DeSoto gets some businesses and something happens. We have to do that. That's right. And it's important that we're in, we have small business owners on our council. We have these relationships with our state reps. And Representative uh, Davis represents the other half of DeSoto, making sure that we have re re relationships with our state representatives and our commissioners to say, hey, this is a need that we have. It is not a, a Frisco need or a Plano need. This is something unique to DeSoto, and I need you to hear us on this, that this is something that, you know, we need for our residents and making sure that that's important. And it's, and it's in the policies that we pass with the NWBE and um, the, the job fairs that we host, the customer service programs. These things just don't happen. <laughs> you have to have people right. who are intentional about um, 
this is how we're going to develop our community. And um, as local elected officials, I think it's, it is well within our right and our responsibility to go and find these things and recruit businesses. As Commissioner talked about, uh, he, told, he shared some exciting things about SpaceX coming to Texas. That, that was someone who, who made Texas that important in front of that employer to say, hey, we need you here. We have to have those same champions and ambassadors for DeSoto so that they think of us when they're thinking of moving from, I don't know, anywhere besides Texas to North Texas. Like, hey, think about us right along I-35 <laughs> in North Texas. Uh, we have access to every, you know, close to Dallas and have access to all the things that you need. So uh, who, who's doing that for us? And we can't expect... Um, Cedar Hill or Dungerville or any of these other cities because they're doing it for themselves. We have to do that. So I think that is our job. And I think, uh, as the mayor said, um, we can get a much better um, with uh, potentially, you know, recruiting some of those companies. But I think what we have now is the right recipe, the right individuals around the table, and the right relationships to start recruiting some of those things that we need specifically here in our city. God, I love what uh, the councilwoman said when, it talk, when she mentioned uh, relationships. So one of the things that's very evident about your area, and sometimes I like to go to communities and just share with the folks some of the great work you're doing. I mean, it's already there. In some communities around the state, a lot of folks still work in silos. The mayor referenced her relationship and the city's relationship with the chamber, the EDC, uh, Cedar Valley College, the ISDs. My challenge to you all would be, that you all serve as the catalyst to have individuals meet maybe on a quarterly basis. Now, Mayor, uh, just so that you know, back in 2016, Governor Abbott charged us to work with TEA and higher ed, and, and this is the brochure that he gave us, but this was the tri-agency report that us three as, an, uh, as a state agency, we were to put together and formulate a plan so that every, every person would be successful as early as pre-K and early as zero to three which you're very familiar with. And so we knew that if we started early, we'd be, we'd, have a, we'd be very successful in the product that we were going to roll out. So putting up your own uh, tri-agency report, you know, come with the, the superintendents and ask them, what are we doing to prepare our workforce for the future? Because I can't get someone to open up a small business if you're not encouraging them that there's a welding demand out there in the community. Cedar Valley College has got an impeccable reputation, not only around the state, but around the country on some of the programs that they put together. It's interesting because I've informed them, and Dr. Seabrooks, who is the president there, has told me multiple times that, Commissioner, you do not have to have a four-year degree to be successful in this great state. And let me tell you, I agree with him, and I've said that at multiple commencement speeches. But I would say, Mayor, and to the city councilwoman, that I would challenge you, and I would be more than happy to support you, to come up with a plan so that we could meet with the superintendents, the, the folks in higher ed. Uh, an example of what uh, Councilwoman Coral said, we met with SpaceX and one of the things that we found interesting was when they, when Elon Musk gave the school district or the county $20 million, uh, what plan was there for the schools, right? And so what we did as of Monday, we, we reached out to the local ESC, which is the Educational Service Center, and um, we invited every superintendent to the table and talked to them, okay, what is your focus going to be? And what is your focus going to be? That way we had a plan and we could present it to, um, to the folks there. But, uh, Mayor, we would be more than happy to, if I had an extra one of these, I'd be more than happy to leave it with you. But it is our, it is our, it is our workbook. It is our rule book. And this is what we're using around the state. And it's everything from servicing, transitioning veterans, how do we cater to those individuals that are in foster care because they come with funding? Or how about those individuals that have disability? You know, those individuals not only get a tax credit, but they also get funding for training. Mm -hmm. And so we provide them with Braille books and we provide them with the, you know, wheelchair accessibility at the home. There's, there's a company right now, CVS Pharmacy, that trains individuals that are disabled, uh, some of them even blind, uh, and they've all received a credential in, um, in a pharmacy technician. And so you'll think, well, how can a person who's visually impaired work at a CVS pharmacy when they can't see the, see the medication? Well, you're probably, one of these days, when you call CVS pharmacy for your medical, a question you may have, you may reach out to somebody who's visually impaired. That person's going to answer your question with the convenience of a Braille book in front of them. And that was the training they received from the Texas workforce in a local board area. As a matter of fact, I think in the Dallas area, 
Uh, we're very excited that they did that. But, Mayor, this is whatever you guys want to lay out. That's our charge. Whatever industry is demanding and whatever your requests are, we'll look at ways that we can support that. Awesome. This has been a, a great forum, it, and I don't know if you guys have been paying attention, but all of these partnerships and offers on the table with the Texas Workforce Commission, Commissioner Alvarez, and the, and the city to do all these other things, or even in, um, ways to look at, he's been given suggestions, take, take a look at this, take a look at this, here are other opportunities. So not only the resources that we've brought today, but there are also so many other that were just birthed in these partnerships here, um, in the partnership here in the conversation. And um, I just want to shout out our, because we are virtual, but uh, Richard A. Prince II, he, um, I want to shout him out because he, as the representative Sherman, and as we were talking about uh, fair chance hiring, he said that he has um, actually employed, no, 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 yeah, Richard A. Prince. He said, I hired two guys and I'm paying them $15 an hour. So, Richard, we want to shout you out because um, even as an employer, as a small business owner, being able to do that or willing to do that, see past, you know, give someone a second chance and see past their, uh, their past as well as not offer, uh, you know, pennies or some, you know, uh, in a, offer them enough that they're able to take care of themselves and their families. A living wage. A living yes, wage, absolutely. Living what wage. we're all after, a living wage. And so, Richard, we want to shout you out as, um, as well for doing it. And thank you for sharing that uh, with us. If we, for the sake of time, I want to make sure that we get this last question in. And we're going to um, hear from Representative Sherman, and then we'll allow our pan panelists to follow up um, afterwards. But the importance, once again, for businesses seeking out and taking advantage of the re available resources. to the unemployment insurance. Uh, we have, uh, from the federal government, uh, received resources uh, as a state, as many of the states receive for unemployment benefits, uh, to the tune of, in the state of Texas, $7 billion. Uh, so that's why it's important for me to co-author uh, HB7 with Representative uh, Angie Chen Button. Uh, this bill will work to replenish that fund that was depleted uh, in the non-effective charges as it relates to the general tax rate uh, developed for unemployment insurance and unemployment uh, benefits. Uh, this is uh, done in two, our, our uh, unemployment uh, benefits come from two uh, tax rate factors. One is from the employer side. The employer accounts is considered the effective charges and that covers a major portion of the benefits. So your, maybe your last employer is paying half of your benefits. And then on the other side is the uh, in effect or non-effective uh, tax charges and that is coming from the state uh, portion and uh, which obviously with COVID, uh, we were hit pretty hard and uh, it's important that we replenish that to ensure that your employees that have been laid out and some of those employee employers, uh, maybe they drive as an Uber driver. Uh, that was so important that it was included uh, in this. So that's important. Now, I wanna get to uh, also uh, for small businesses, for the employer. Uh, you should know that I co-authored uh, or joint authored uh, legislation 4101, HB 4101, with Representative Jarvis Johnson out of Houston. Now, this bill will permit state agencies to establish a small business program which limits the bidding on certain contracts expending less than $1 million uh, to small business. So to be very clear, what this will mean, this to me is a game changer. If we can get this bill through committee, it will mean, and get it out of calendars and uh, voted on the floor, it will mean that small businesses 
will now have uh, a pool of bidding opportunities in which only a small business can even qualify and bid for it. So many times, large companies, large corporations, are bidding for uh, a multiplicity of small contracts along with their large contracts. And because of that, uh, they're uh, able to scoop up all of the uh, small contracts. So this bill, HB 4111, uh, will help to ensure uh, that we uh, have, create more parity for competition uh, for the small businesses. After all, it's the small companies that hire more people than the large companies. And so I hope uh, that we can get this, this bill passed and that you will call your representative, not me, I'm already on there, but call another representative <laughs> uh, to uh, support this legislation. It's very important. All right, panel, final thoughts um, around this and recaps. I uh, just want to charge you with, imagine a Texas or imagine a world filled with thriving small businesses and entrepreneurs um, and the long-term benefits. What does that look like? Looks like it looks now. Uh, I think uh, the folks here, not only in, in, the, in the DeSoto area, but around the state, people are hungry. Um, and sometimes the information that's shared with them uh, makes them more um, more inclined to want to do something. I think it's unfortunate that that there's times when um, folks that really want to uh, provide a service, regardless of what that service is, do not know the the details of what's out there for them. Uh, but I do think that Texans are always thriving. Uh, Texans want to start their own business. Or if they don't, they want to be good workers. And every Texan wants the same chance as everyone else. Um, you know, I can't help but 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 um, but reiterate that that this community, along with the rest of Texas, is thriving. Uh, or mentioned earlier is, you know, we're the ninth largest economy in the world. It, you know, Texas doesn't do it by themselves. DeSoto is a big part of that, and so are our neighboring cities. You know, they're in, we're all in this together. And um, I will tell you that I'm very proud of the workforce solution offices that we have around the state and the work that we've done working with municipalities like the, the mayor and the councilwoman coming up with ideas outside the box thinking. And I think the constituents that we serve deserve that. I think they are looking for an opportunity. And all we did today and what we've been doing is providing them with the information that's out there. Now, I can't make someone drink the water, and neither can the mayor. But we can provide the services until we're blue in the face, and we'll do our very best. So I would just say that we have a vibrant, nothing's changed, whether it was COVID, pre-COVID. I think people are, are have always been um, open uh, to the idea of, um, of, um, uh, of an opportunity, regardless of who you are. And um, what I do love about this community is you have a fine institution, as I referenced earlier, and the fact that these individuals are, are catering to those individuals that have barriers. You know, some of us have barriers. We don't know how to fill out a FAFSA. My parents didn't know how to fill out a FAFSA application, that, nor did they ever desire me to go to college, because they didn't. And we have people here in this community that want our children to be better. And so I'm amazed by some of the programs that the mayor and the, and the councilwoman have laid out. Uh, my hat's off to you. Uh, now it's time for us to get to work and to put, uh, you know, to make a commitment to you all that we will support your initiatives uh, as, as much as we can. And uh, I just wanted to, I know these are final thoughts, but I did want to take this opportunity to thank the mayor and, of course, uh, the, the deceased mayor, the one that I really came to admire, you know, McGowan. Uh, I loved her. Uh, I met her many years ago, and I really care about her. And I think uh, you've carried the torch well, you and your council, and you guys are full of energy. My God. I thought I was energetic. Uh, I'm worn out after listening to these people. But, but going back to the original question, I think we've always been in a, in a, in a position where uh, we, we have never let nothing down. Not, not even this pandemic brought us down. So thank you for that. And that's a great question.
Last words, Councilwoman. Yes. So um, I think it looks like um, I think it looks like an opportunity, um, an opportunity to thrive, an opportunity to live, an opportunity to prosper. I think, um, and it, it also is about dignity. Um, a good job provides dignity of being able to provide for yourself, provide for your family, and then contribute to community. I think um, a lot of times the um, the, the work that we bring or the things that we do, um, it becomes, you know, labeled as work or negativity, but it is it's honorable to provide for your family and to provide that, we hope, with a living decent wage. Um, no one should be starving, and we, we don't want people to have to work just to starve, just a little bit less. We want you to thrive and to prosper and build, um, and I think what our job is in on um, the elected official side is to make sure that we're providing all those resources for anyone that wants to start a business. Here is how you do it. Here is the blueprint. Here are access resources. Here are numbers, mentors, um, you know, folks that have done and have experienced themselves like the people on this day. And so I think that's what our job is to provide that to folks. And, um, and you just have to have the will um, and, and, and you just have to have to want to do it. So I think a lot of times um, those things are kind of out there. If you know who to know and know who to talk to, we should be making it easier for folks. So our Economic Development Center, our business incubator, the Workforce Commission right down the street in Dallas, all those things are places that have resources for those that want to go into that field and to start their own thing. So we applaud our small businesses. We can't do anything without them. They are the largest employer uh, of, of most of our country uh, is a small business. So I want to make sure that, at least on our side as the elected officials, we're doing everything we can um, through policy, through program, uh, any way that we see possible to support anyone who wants to thrive, live, and prosper. Thank you. All right. And Mayor, final words from you. Yes, I will echo the sentiments of my other two colleagues here, especially when we talk about what that looks like. I think it does look a lot like it looks now. I think here in the city of DeSoto specifically, because that's where we are, um, we have a very strong and vibrant entrepreneurial spirit just throughout the city, even for those who may not yet have a small business. The spirit of entrepreneurship rests heavy on the city of DeSoto. And something that you said, Commissioner, resonated with me, which is, that the resources are definitely out there. I mean, look at how much we've shared just in this, the short time, and we could probably go on and on with things that, you know, people can take advantage of. A lot of times it's just that they don't know the resources are out there or they don't know that they're available to them. And sometimes it can be intimidating, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that just kind of going back to the pandemic, I think sometimes crisis uh, shows us what's not working well. It shows us kind of where the bottlenecks are and where the things are broken and what we're trying to do. And the thing that, that I saw, and, and specifically I think I'll just use this example, is for the PPP loans, right? We know that there were a lot of systemic things that um, prevented a lot of, especially our minority business owners, from receiving those loans. However, there was a twofold part that I began to see as we began to look more closely in the, um, the disparage in, in individuals that were not receiving those PPP loans. And a lot of it was just, to be quite honest, they didn't have the, the, the business acumen. They didn't have the language. They didn't have the financials. They didn't have the banking relationships and all of these things that made them able to actually even compete on that level when we talk about getting access to some of those major resources and capital that businesses were needing in that time of crisis. And so, you know... We have to make sure that we are taking advantage, kind of going back to uh, some things we mentioned earlier, that we're taking advantage of these. And some things that I just wanted to highlight, because I'm sitting here looking at some of these resource links, and it's something that I hold very dear to my heart, because as I mentioned earlier, I grew up in an entrepreneurial family, so entrepreneurship was nothing new to me. However, when I started my own corporation, um, definitely very much so different than managing what my dad started. It's a whole different ball game when you dig something out of the ground yourself. And one of those places that I started at to get free mentorship, I'm going to say it again louder for the people in the back, okay. free mentorship was the Small Business Development Center here in the city of Dallas. 
at Bill J. Priest. And so that is, it was an awesome opportunity for me to get literally one-to-one -one counseling on things like how to get my business plan, how to get my financials. I think I went through the fast track course. It was a 10 week program. This was back in 2009, 2010, when I was starting all this stuff, my entity, I, I, I actually, I feel so proud. I still, this corporation is actually still in it. I have it today. <laughs> I set up my very own C corporation myself through mentorship there at the small business development center. So even if I don't do a whole lot of business, with it I refuse to like <laughs> shut it down I try to keep just enough stuff going on with it so I don't have to shut it down because it's so so I get so emotional about it because it's the first thing that I did on my own but just resources like these that are literally available for free they're yours for the taking um, just urging you guys to take advantage of that because again we are your biggest champions and we will not stop like commissioner said we will put this stuff out here till we're blue in the face but mm -hmm. we cannot make you guys take it so if you are watching this today if you're watching this replay share this information take advantage of this information and go be great and rise DeSoto y'all know if y'all hear me anytime my signature line is DeSoto <laughs> rises and I absolutely believe that and I believe that as we continue to get more resources like this funnel to our community we will continue to rise. Absolutely, DeSoto rises. And um, just because we are in the technology space, I just want to highlight one more comment. Andre Bird, he wanted to say uh, the community appreciates your commitment. He, so he's talking to the panel that the, the community appreciates your commitment to doing your job and doing your job well. Again, Thank you, Councilman Bird, for for adding that comment on there. It's good to see our council members <laughs> in the comments, so thank you. I was going to let him be anonymous, but okay. We're oh, calling no. people out today. <laughs> All right, so the, re the resource links are on the screen. Take a screenshot if you're watching from your phone or your computer. That way you'll have those resources whenever you need to refer back to them. Again, we want to give a big thank you to uh, our state representative, Carl Sherman, our DeSoto City uh, Councilwoman, Candace uh, Quarles, the commission, Texas Workforce Commissioner, Commissioner Julian, Julian Alvarez. I'm going to pronounce it right by the end of the day, I promise you. And of course, our very own Mayor Rachel L. Proctor. And I've been your moderator for uh, this panel, Tenil T. Terry. So remember, small business is big business. And that has been the City of DeSoto Presents Small Business Stakeholder Meeting. Have a great evening. <laughs>